Hi, I'm Alyssa Spencer, and I'm a professor of neurology and a co-director for the Center for Duchenne Muscular Dystrophy at UCLA. And I'll be speaking today about muscle inflammation and acute muscle injury. When muscle is injured, immune cells come into the muscle, and they come and into the endomyceal space, and they envelop and invade muscle fibers. And you can see on this slide, there are small hematoxylin-positive cells sort of enveloping some of the fibers and, and in between the fibers. And this is known as inflammation. And we hear about inflammation in the media and in the literature in a negative context. But is this really negative for muscle? Is it negative for muscle repair? So let's go to a case study. So in this case study, scientists experimentally induce muscle injury with notexin, which is similar to cardiotoxin, and then they examine two conditions. They looked at muscle repair in the presence and absence of circulating monocytes. And those circulating monocytes eventually go into the muscle and become macrophages. And they asked the question, what happens to muscle repair in the presence or absence of these cells? So first, I'll remind you of the time course of muscle repair uh, that occurs following cardiotoxin or notexin injury. So I'm showing you a seven-day time course, and these are cross-sections stained by hematoxylin. And you can see over seven days, um, muscle starts out at day one, pretty blown out. By day two, you start to see the presence of mononucleated cells. They, they stain purple by hematoxylin. By day four, the, the cells, the cross-section is filled with, with uh, hematoxylin-positive cells, and those could be immune cells, those could be satellite cells proliferating. And by day seven, you see almost completely regenerated muscle. Those are not fully um, differentiated fibers. Those are, you know, pretty big myotubes. But you see an almost completely regenerated muscle. And in the case where you remove the monocytes, basically removing the ability to have macrophages in the muscle, what you see is by day four, the muscles look very similar. But by day seven, you do not see regeneration. And so what this case study tells us is that macrophages, at least, are very important for muscle repair. And so that tells us that the immune system, and thus inflammation, is actually a positive for muscle repair. And that there is an interdependence between muscle and immune cells. So what I'll do today is take you through the process of acute muscle injury and the different steps and how immune cells and immune medi mediators play a role. So in the earliest stages of muscle injury, represented by this muscle cell and this um, blue star that is the damage to the cell, um, we have release of damps, damage associated molecular patterns, and these substances called alarmins. And what those do is they trigger and tell the immune system that there is a problem in the tissue. Also, platelets secrete fibrinogen, which is converted by fibrin, by, is converted by thrombin to fibrin to sort of make a clot and stabilize the area. The next thing that occurs is mast cells, which are in the tissue. They release a histamine and tumor necrosis factor. And you can see on this slide uh, a real electron micrograph of a mast cell. And you can see within that mast cell these very large granules. They're black, they're big, and those sit there inside the mast cell ready to be released. And this is a very important part of inflammation. So maybe you've had an, an injury, you've had a sprain, or you've had um, a large contusion, and you know you get swelling when that happens. And that is because of these mast cells, because what they do is they release these substances. And histamine, what it does is it causes blood vessels to swell and become leaky. And when they become leaky, fluid leaks out into the interstitial tissues, and you get swelling. And the purpose of that is to, um, to not create swelling. That is a byproduct, but to actually allow the immune cells to come into the tissue. So that facilitates immune entry into the tissue. 
The other thing that occurs is the tumor necrosis factor increases the expression of these cell adhesion molecules, CAMs, and they're represented here by these um, blue hearts. And those CAMs are like a sign to immune cells that are traveling through the vasculature. And they say, hey, come over to this tissue. This tissue is damaged. And they tell the immune cells, come in. So all of these early stages are designed to signal to the immune system and to facilitate the entry into the tissue. And a last early stage is that release of cytokines from macrophages, resident macrophages that are, are sitting in the tissue. So these are very mature macrophages. They serve a surveillance function, and they're just there as an early warning sign to recruit other cells. And one of the cytokines that these macrophages secrete is macrophage chemotactic protein 1. And so one of the earlier cells that responds to that MCP1 is the neutrophil. So these neutrophils are granulocytes. They're not very smart cells, but they're early, they're early invaders, and they're a very commonly um, seen cell in any kind of wound healing. And they come in and they, they clear out the tissue. They, they're phagocytic, and they do two things. They secrete these substances called proteolytic enzymes, which are secreted and digest the tissue and facilitate phagocytosis. And they also secrete reactive oxygen species. And these reactive oxygen species damage membranes and help to break them down. And, and that also facilitates phagocytosis. So the macrophages then, after they break down all of the area, they then phagocytose it and then they kind of just die. Um, so they're there early, they break it down, they clear the area, and they help make way for new tissue formation. And they, they, they signal for monocytes to then enter the tissue. So monocytes are the circulating form of macrophages. They're the undifferentiated form that circulate in the blood when those monocytes are recruited to muscle or any tissue, they come in and they become a macrophage upon differentiation. And anytime you have a blood cell coming into the muscle, we call that extravasation. That is a blood cell coming across the blood vessel. So when I use that word extravasation, I'm referring to that process of cells coming across the vessel. And macrophages, they do a lot of different functions when they enter, but three of them are the release of other reactive oxygen species, particularly nitric oxide. Uh, and these, this also, this substance also damages membranes and it nitrosylates proteins, so it's very damaging to proteins actually. Um, they phagocytose debris. They also phagocytose the dead neutrophils and they release cytokines to further ramp up the immune response. But eventually, they then become a different type of macrophage. They become M2 macrophages. So this is sort of a juncture in the process of uh, inflammation and muscle repair. So the earlier stages are all about ramping up the immune response and degrading all the dead tissue. And now we're at a point where we want to ramp down the immune response and we want to start repairing the muscle. And that is the role of these M2 macrophages. So in the earliest stages, you see M1 macrophages, but then you start to see M2 macrophages. And we don't really know if the M1 macrophages change their phenotype to M2s or if the resident macrophages actually start proliferating and become M2s. This is a mystery in the field and we don't really know. But these M2 macrophages are more of the anti-inflammatory type. And we know macrophages can change their phenotype depending on the tissue environment. But in the context of muscle injury and muscle repair, what we see is there's always M1 first and M2 second. 
So the M1s ramp up the immune response, they secrete pro-inflammatory cytokines, the M2s turn down the immune response, they secrete anti-inflammatory cytokines, and they start secreting repair factors. And two of these repair factors are insulin-like growth factor, IGF, and LIF, leukemia inhibition factor. And both of these are known to act on satellite cells. So you know you have satellite cells or resident stem cells that are, are poised to become muscle. They sit in the muscle tissue, and when they become activated by these substances, they proliferate and they fuse and they repair the muscle. Another cell type that is then recruited to muscle is the eosinophil. This is another myeloid type cell. And eosinophils secrete a substance called interleukin-4, or IL-4. And IL-4 is known to do two things that participate in muscle repair. One, it activates these fibroadipogenic precursors. And these cells participate in phagocytosis, and we know they're necessary to have muscle repair. And if you don't have them, you don't have the repair. And secondly, we know that IL-4 is very important for muscle cell fusion. So later stages of muscle repair involve these satellite cells fusing together to make myotubes. So why do we know that IL-4 and eosinophils uh, are so important for this process? Well, a study was done by Heredia et al. where they actually used mice that lacked eosinophils. And you can see in this figure, uh, I'm comparing wild-type mice to the mice lacking eosinophils, and they induced cardiotoxin, induced damage, and then they looked at two things. They looked at their ability to take up Evans blue dye, which I'm sure you've learned about by Dr. Crosby Watson, and they also just looked at the muscle repair. And as you can see, the mice lacking eosinophils were, are still blue. The muscles from those animals. You can see they're still blue. Whereas the wild-type mice, they completely repaired, and there's very little blue that's present. You don't even need to look at cross-sections. And if you look at the H&E, you can see that there are these areas that did not repair very well in the mice lacking eosinophils. So these studies suggest that eosinophils and IL-4 uh, coming from the eosinophils are very important for muscle repair. So what I'm hoping that you take from this lecture is that the order and timing and appearance of these immune cells is very important to orchestrate proper muscle repair. So you see early on you have mast cells and resonant macrophages and neutrophils, as well as M1 macrophages as part of the ramping up of the immune response, and then later you see M2 macrophages, eosinophils, and FAPs as part of the ramping down of the immune response and facilitation of repair. So let's review what we learned from this first mini lecture. And I'd like to pose the question to you, how do immune cells facilitate muscle repair? What do you remember from this lecture? I'll let you think about it. So immune cells are necessary first to phagocytose debris and also to secrete repair factors. What I didn't put in this slide is they're also necessary to recruit other immune cells to participate in this process. I've mentioned many different players in the process today, and now I've listed them all for you here. So you can review these different players and refresh your memory on how they all participate in the various steps. And now I'd like you to think about two examples of experiments that demonstrate a positive role for immune cells in the process of muscle repair. If you recall, we talked about two experiments that interfered with the role of immune cells in animal models and showed that when we interfere with these cell types, um, repair is impaired. So the first type was the monocytes, and 
that experiment showed that interfering with monocytes completely interfered with repair. And the second was the eosinophils. So in the double GATA knockout mice, there was an effect on um, re repair and Evans blue dye did not uh, become excluded from the muscle and repair was impaired as well. So those are two examples of when interference with two cell types uh, impeded muscle repair. So that's the end of our lecture today and please stay tuned for our next lecture which focuses on chronic muscle injury and the role of the immune system. Thank you.